Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. I'm delighted to say our guest is Dr. Thomas Yuli. He's a, an author, human business architect, and human being. Uh, Dr. Thomas, welcome to the show. Well, welcome, and uh, thank you for having me. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's awesome to have you. And let's, well, okay, let's, let's start with what you mean by human business architect, and then we can perhaps get a little bit into uh, the human business paradigm of, of which you've written. Absolutely. Well, um, I consider, call myself a human business architect because uh, my interest and my, my work is I help businesses to become or to be human. Uh, or to build in more human elements, uh, in contrast to say some mechanic uh, Tayloristic models, where we, uh, where people are being treated as human resources, uh, like units. Um, you know, in a human business, we treat people as human beings, and you know, find 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 ways and means to unfold our human potential. And then probably that's one of the main differences. You know, of being just let's say. Um, um, management consultant or a strategy consultant uh, versus a human business architect. Right, right. And for people who are not familiar with the term Tayloristic, what, what, what's the contrast you're making there? Well, Tayloristic, Taylor, he said like, okay, you know, what's important is like that we, uh, we put uh, the, the organization, you know, at the forefront, at the core, and you know, the human being human or the human beings are not number one anymore. And um, it's the foundation of management in the 19th and 20th century where we designed businesses as if they were machines with, with input, throughput, feedback loops, uh, output. And I'm not criticizing it per se, because like uh, the terroristic model uh, served its goal uh, for a very, very long time. I mean, we designed uh, wonderful uh, enterprises. Uh, um, you know, it, it worked, let's put it this way, for the time being. However, it also assumed um, uh, people to be, we say, dumb. <laughs> you can say dumb because they didn't really have any education. Well, this has changed because, like, not, not, not only do we have very good schools, some are better than others. You know, we have universities, what have you, and we have the internet. We're better educated. So, uh, treating us as stupid, dumb machines or units just doesn't make sense anymore. And that's the old terroristic model. And uh, I, I think it's, it's outdated, especially uh, considering the changes we we're experiencing these days. And you're, you're presenting this, this new paradigm, the, the human business paradigm. Yeah, tell us a little about, uh, well, perhaps about the genesis for that and, and then put a bit of flesh on the bone. Yeah, the, the genesis, that's a, good, that's a good question. See, I have, I've been working in, in projects for more than 20 years as a project manager, as a coach, um, consultant. And my sincere interest was in so-called wow projects you know projects that leave a legacy were uh, just like very important that generate great value for the customers to light the customer the people working in it just like a wow project and what i found out is like hey it's not about the product the technology that makes uh, the difference it's not about the processes or the framework the methodology it's about the people in the team and but nobody talks about it. I mean, we talk about when we talk about innovation, we talk about product innovation, process innovation. Nobody talks about people innovation. The fact is, products and processes do not innovate. People do. But so why don't we just talk about people innovation? And so I thought like, well, then on, on, the, on the business side, it's like, well, pretty much the same thing. Where is the human being? Okay. And, um, you know, so that idea evolved more and more, you know, having worked as an agile coach for a very, very long time, uh, understanding the, the, the need and the value of us being human beings, um, I came up with this, what I call a human, uh, human business paradigm or manifesto where, um, you know, I try to summarize the key points of what a human business, um, you know, why is it so special? Yeah, and I, I like that as it, it seems to me like your starting point there is language and, and observing the language we use. And you're, you're quite right, even as I reflect on it now, even I suppose the more human centered writings and philosophies that exist still use a lot of language that has nothing to do with humans. Right? Absolutely, yes, yes. And, and I'm, I'm not sure if that's going to change in the near future uh, because language is very powerful. Uh, but since it's powerful, why would, then let's use, uh, lose, use it properly, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you have, you have this, this, this 10 point, uh, manifesto. I mean, yes. maybe, maybe take us through the ones that are closest to your heart as a starting point. Uh, well, 
um, there, are, yeah, there are 10 principles. Um, the first two, they deal with uh, purpose and vision, uh, where I'm saying that a human business is uh, human-centered. So the most important focus is serving, delighting its customers, the workforce, and business and society. So it's like, we say, well, as humans, like, what about the customers? Well, the customer usually are human beings. Uh, the workforce, the people working for the company, human beings. Business, you know, people working there, it's business and society. So it's human-centered, it's, it's holistic. And th the purpose of human business is then to generate and add sustainable value to its customers, to the workforce, to the business and to, so, and to, to uh, society. So in other words, purpose and vision, that's like the first two principles. Um, principles three and four uh, deal with collaboration, um, where human business promotes diversity in the workforce and it's, you know, as it is reflected in society. So it's not just like uh, guys, you know, it's like women and, 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 and men at this, you know, it's, it's a diverse, diverse teams. And then human business advocates cross-function and self-organizing teams. And uh, this is very agile, I can say. I mean, so it's not, nothing really new to those people who have been working in agile environments. So this is dealing with collaboration. So it's not really too new. It's, it's common sense, you can say. But there's a difference between common sense and common practice, as we know. Um, the third uh, uh, pillar, you can say, it's about performance. But we're not machines that you know, perform. But actually, human business nourishes joy and happiness in its daily operation. That means like when we're joyful, when we do something with happiness, we, we produce better quality. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and what we practice in nurture is like more like a conscious leadership of enablement and, and empowerment. It's not like a, you have a hierarchy, the top knows, uh, the man, top manager knows best. No, it's about empowerment, it's about enablement. And uh, the joy and happiness is not, um, how should I say, it's a driver, it's, it's inside of us. So when you build an environment where, uh, where joy takes place, where we can live you know, this joy from within, um, we perform better. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting you've used the term but, but performance. I mean, people don't tend to cluster performance and joy and happiness together. Um, yeah. so, so explain that a bit. Are you saying that we're, we're replacing the idea of performance with a focus on joy and happiness or um, something else? What's it's not really replacing. I mean, let's, let's face it. I mean, uh, it's not like when we work, it's not all about like happiness, you know, like have a party and you know, doing yoga and, and what have you. I mean, we do have to work. We have to perform after all. I mean, that's what we're being paid for. And we want to produce something in most cases. So we do have to talk about performance and there's nothing wrong with it. It's basically that we're using our skills and our potential for something better. So it's like, this is like what we're here for. I mean, this is, it can be a very joyful experience. Does not mean that we're always happy, okay? Um, you, can, you can have like, a, uh, you can do a, uh, have a practice full of joy. That does not mean that you're happy uh, the whole day. You know, there will be times when it's hard work, you know, it will be stressful. That does not mean there is no, there, there is a lack of joy. You know, it's, you know, joy is like, it's like, a, happiness is like a temporary moment, you can say, okay? It can fade. Uh, joy is more or less permanent if we realize that it can be. Right. But, th but doesn't that set up a potential, a bit of a conflict there, right? Because sometimes you might have to sacrifice happiness and joy for, for performance. Um, you know, that's a good point. Um, let's, put, let's put it this way. A um, couple of years ago, when I uh, was coaching, actually was leading a, a team, um, and we had an agile approach. So in our daily uh, uh, session in the morning, uh, we asked the three questions like, what have we accomplished um, yesterday? What are we going to accomplish today? And uh, where do we need help? And I added the fourth question. And that was, what will make me happy today? And the people looked at me and said, what do you mean? What makes you happy? It's like, yeah, what makes you happy? Let's talk about it. Are you anything? Or does it relate to work? It's like, what makes you happy? Okay, so people talked about some of about work, some people talked about what they plan to do afterwards. And I remember one said, uh, she will be very happy if she makes, uh, makes it to the volleyball practice, you know, outside. And we said like, what does it mean? Well, we start playing at seven o'clock outside beach volleyball. It's like, and when would you have to leave? 
Well, usually it takes one hour, so five o'clock would be the earliest, but you know, understand if it's not possible. And then we said like, no, wait a sec, you wanna play beach volleyball. Um, it's your hobby. So why don't we do this? You leave at five. We make, make it possible that you leave at five. If there's anything that we still have to finish, we'll take care of it, or you do it afterwards, but you go play volleyball. And she was so excited the whole day because she felt like, oh, I don't have to worry whether or not I can make it. And she was like thrilled and didn't have an impact on her performance, not only on her individual performance, the whole team. Uh, and another example was like a colleague of mine said like he would be very happy if a workshop goes well. And I said like, Hartmut, that was my happy. Um, but you know what? I will be happy if I can make you happy. And so, so it went, you know, and then for a week, we forgot the happy question. And uh, the atmosphere and the team and the performance uh, went down. Uh, you can tell the difference. Um, that was two years ago, I changed this happy question um, or modified it a little bit um, and asked, okay, what are you grateful for today? It could be anything. And people say like, well, that's a wonderful question. Uh, can I still answer the happy question? <laughs> okay. And so they did. And the whole atmosphere was much lighter. And actually they started the, the daily with this question. Um, it didn't extend the, the 15 minutes, um, but they focused on what mattered most to them at that moment. Um, and it put, uh, created something like a framework, framework for a performance. And we realized, you know, if you want to bring, if you want to build synergy, you have to acknowledge um, our limitations as well as our potential. And not as machines, but again, as human beings. And happiness and joy, very, very human. You know, very individual. There is no, there is no definition. So what makes you happy today? Or, you know, what are you grateful for? Could be anything. And I like the idea of that being a daily practice, right? Because what makes me happy today isn't the same as what's going to make me happy tomorrow. Uh, yeah. And, and creating it as a habit by having it as something daily means it's more likely to, to stick and emerge right, over, as, a, uh, as a facet of the culture over time. There's, yeah. there's one thing you can add. Uh, we captured every happy uh, note on, on post-its. So we had a happiness wall or joy wall. And after two weeks or so, you get like a, a sense, what kind of environment do we need uh -oh. uh, to build a high performing culture? Okay. And it sometimes could be, sometimes I had to do something with the uh, logistics or something else, you know, but it gives you also like for lessons learned, uh, how you want to build, you know, a happy project. Happy people, they perform better, the quality is better. If you're burned out, if you're tired, you know, software developers, tired software, software developers, they produce crap code. You know, why don't you do, want to do it right, right in the first place? I love that. A happy wall. Uh, and I love how that's completely bottom up. So it's not like you're trying to work out what a happiness framework is, right? No. You, you're, 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 like, you're just building it from this question getting answered every day. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I like that. And it reminds me of something, uh, another guest, and, and she had the, as part of their business practice when they bring people into the company and, and then on a regular basis, they have these dream consultations. Yeah. And that isn't some Jungian analysis thing. That's, uh, that's, people, that's the, the manager asking the, the person, what, what, what's your dream? What, 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 what dream do you have? And this is in their lives, not at work. This is in their lives. And, that, and then part of the role of the company is to have that, individual's dream happen and they've done all they, they've ended up creating a joint partnership with a safari company in africa to have this person's dream of spending a year on safari fulfilled they worked with one of their clients who was a travel agent to have this guy have its whole family go out to watch the rugby cup world cup in australia so so all of these things emerged in the culture from that simple question of you know what's your what's what's your dream so yeah very powerful yeah. i can see um Okay, so that's performance. Um, well, there are two, two more. I mean, there's learning and results. I mean, with respect to learning, uh, human business, you know, we want to have like an open and a learning organization and where you actually celebrate failure. I mean, if you want to be innovative and you're afraid of making mistakes, uh, you're in the wrong business. Uh, you know, you just have to find, okay, what kind of setup do we need to 
so we can you know continuously find ways and means to to improve our performance you know um, do something different and um, we share our, our findings with other people so it's open it's more like an open innovation environment so learning is very very important and not just learning and mechanical learning uh, can be what I call generative learning and generate generative learning is has to do something with playing um, like as kids I mean, we unlearn to play, but we learn the most when we play. So, um, and let's do something crazy sometimes, like, uh, you know, and find, find different ways to um, ask funny questions or stupid questions. Well, people, some of them, at least, I think, are stupid questions. And um, enjoy the, the learning experience or making mistakes, you know, where we say never make a mistake more than twice. So you can learn from it. And it's like when you invite mistakes early, especially you know, in Agile, you know, then it's wonderful because then the quality later on would be much better. Yeah. Um, with respect to, to results, I mean, everything, all purpose, vision, collaboration, performance, learning, everything is wonderful. At the end of the day, you, we have to deliver. So results are very important. Um, and there has to be, however, like a, a balance between short, mid, and long term results or deliverables. Um, if you just have a short-term focus like EBIT, uh, it will not do the trick. I mean, you have to have the long-term vision um, in, in, in your mind as well. Um, so that's, that's an art, balancing short, mid, and, and long-term perspectives. And with respect to profits, profits are very important also in, in business, but they result from great work. Profit is not a purpose, it's a result. Uh, so it's not, I mean, human business is purpose-driven. It's not profit-driven. And there's a big difference, okay? Um, because yeah, people, people, people don't have profits. People have purposes, right? Yeah. Yeah, when you have a purpose and you follow through, there will be profit. You know, if you just focus on profit, profit for whom? I mean, are you delighting the customer? Or who, you know, where's the added value? If you just focus on the stakeholders and on the, and the shareholders, okay, um, sooner or later, you will be out of business. Um, even the um, business roundtable in, in the U.S., they finally um, have realized that you know it's a it's a dead end if they just focus on uh, maximizing shareholder that uh, not even value shares, you know. And the other thing is like on on a more global level, you can say uh, rather than have a linear economy, a human business um, advocates a circular economy where we we keep the resources and, and use for as long as possible. And we extract the, the maximum value from the wealth and use and recover, regenerate products and materials at the end of each service life, if, if possible. And actually, it is possible. We can actually create lots and lots of jobs um, if we um, you know, advocate a more circular economy. But that's more on a global level. Um, but that's worth digging into for people who are not familiar then. So, the, so contrast, so what's linear it, that, to which you're contrasting here, the circular economy? Well, the, the linear economy is like you produce something, there is waste, and then you just throw it away. Okay, so you have a plastic bottle. I mean, what do you do? It's like you drink a bottle of water and then you throw it away. I mean, and, and it doesn't come back. You can recycle it, but, you know, what can you do? Uh, but there, or take like, uh, uh, say, computer or an electronic device, you know. Uh, it's meant to work for, or it's built to work for, say, two, two years, if, if it's two years. Okay, and then it will break. It's, it's designed this way. It doesn't have to be this way because people know it could design it for, for ages, you know, but no, they throw it away. And what can you do with it? And it's like, um, you know, circular economy looks at like we don't have to do this. I mean, we can, we can use and reuse, um, you know, products, even services for a much longer time, uh, produce less waste, and uh, we don't have to exploit all the resources we have. So that's the idea behind it. And some people are skeptical. Fact is, who benefits from it most? us i mean we can see the planet okay it's not just like planet it's like something abstract it's our immediate environment we live in right and i suppose the hardcore capitalist would might say something like well first of all on the shareholder point well if 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 we don't um if we're not in business to maximize shareholder value then the resources will end up in the wrong hands right this is a way to efficiently distribute resources across companies because the companies who do the best with the resources they get they'll get more resources and those who don't spend their their capital efficiently uh will get less resources and that's and that's a good way to organize a society because well, we can use our resources more efficiently 
that's what they claim. But if you look at the numbers, you know, uh, they, they tell us a different story. I mean, the companies who just focus have focused on uh, shareholder value. I mean, their performance have, has deteriorated. Um, Jack Welch, who he who you know, former C, uh, CEO of uh, General Electric. I mean, he he was like he one of the advocates of shareholder uh, value, and and then he retired. He said, "Share shareholder value. Uh, that's the dumbest idea of the world." That's what he's saying now, because like if he said, if you want to build sustainable business, and if you only focus on shareholder value, I mean, you will be out of business in no time. If you look at Amazon. Amazon, Jeff Bezos said, like, you know, if I only focus on what the customers would like to have in two or three years, we'll be out of business. You know, I'm interested in, you know, what will we need or what can, what kind of demand can we create, you know, for customers in seven years. So we'll build a foundation. Uh, everyone's smiling at Amazon where they said, oh, we'll do something in the cloud and say, what kind of cloud, you know, web services, like there is no future. And, and they have almost built like a monopoly uh, where NASA is using the Amazon cloud. So looking at ha having the courage to, to look ahead, of course, making mistakes. Yeah. But if you can, if you have only have a short term uh, focus, it's not going to fly. I'm not saying though, and human business doesn't say short term focus, Abbott is bad thing. What I'm, what human business is saying, you have to balance short, mid and long term perspectives. Then that's, that's what, what is important. Right. And what about the, 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 the critics of the circular economy who might say something like, well, hang on, if we're, but let's just allow the businesses that do one thing to focus on that business and where they create waste products or, or they cause some other disruption in the environment, then other businesses will emerge. And if society wants it to deal with that part of the process, and isn't that a more efficient, efficient way of organizing ourselves? Well, well, who's organizing it? You know, the things like, I'm not saying that with a circular economy, I would be very skeptical if somebody said, let's, let's plan it top down. Um, I think it's not going to work in an economy. It's like, well, I'm an economist, you know, I haven't, um, you know, I was, I'm a trained neoclassic economist, you can say. Uh, so I heard the whole spiel, <laughs> uh, but was very skeptical, always, always on. It's, it's a good model. Let's put it, it's a model, but reality looks different. Okay. So the question is like, what kind of incentives can we, um, can we come up with so that the economy can regulate itself? You know, if you if you people say we have to do top down, we're talking about bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is very slow. It's not very innovative, but you need to have as an incentive. So, for example, you know what? You can have your plastic bottle. That's fine. But you have to have to deposit, say, of one dollar, one euro. You can still use the plastic bottle, but there's a deposit on it for one euro. And then you return it. And then it's up to there. Maybe there will be some new industry that will recycle it. But the point is like. Can you, what kind of uh, consumption uh, patterns do we, uh, you know, are sustainable? I mean, it's not just plastic bottles, all the wrapping and packages and packaging, et cetera, you know, with the plastic and, and the ocean and, uh, and our food and our water. And it affects us, you know, in, in a negative way. Uh, people don't see it because it's so far away. Um, and when they see it, when they realize it, it's in the backyard, it's too late. Yeah. And it, and it sounds to me as you're talk, talking is that you, it, we're really talking about a different starting point. So if we start from a different set of principles, we can develop our economic theories and our management theories and our, uh, I suppose, uh, societal uh, theories around you know, how we can organize at that level for, in a different way if we, if we start from a different place, you know, all the way back to the language we're beginning at beginning with is something like that exactly you know sometimes you think like say if you start a new business and you don't have any any resource no money i mean it could be a, a huge distant, distant you know disincentive you can say a disadvantage or it could be an advantage because we have to be more creative you have to work with whatever is available okay mm. if everything is being you know uh, served to you then uh, you know it's, it's, it's luxury you can say but if you know we, sometimes we become more creative when we where we see no way out, you know, that's cool. Sometimes it can be, um, the, the, you know, it's like, uh, we're talking about climate change, uh, which is a, a huge problem. Um, I, I'm not as skeptical as some people are because I do believe that technology can actually also help us uh, overcome some of the difficulties, but maybe we'll just have to ask different questions. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that interests me, and we've talked about this before we go on the show, is you, you've taken some of these ideas to to Davos, uh, and I, and there was a, I had a little smile. I was like, oh, there's an agile coach talking at Davos. That seems 
that seems like something shifted that that's a conversation that's now part of that community um so yeah tell us a little bit about that for the listeners how you ended up at davos and how did that go well, and, yeah, I have been in Davos already, I think, four or five times, and, and slowly but steadily building um, a, a network. And so last last time I actually made it to a panel and the, and the launch of the Female Quotient, which is a wonderful organization, by the way. And we talked about, I said, the, the panel was called The Art of um, New Business, uh, Body, Mind, and Spirit of Digitalization, which for some people are like, how does this fit together? I mean, you know. Uh, body, mind, and heart, you know, and digital is like, yeah, it's like the human element goes in there. Um, so it's not so much from the agile perspective, but it was more of from the perspective, okay, what kind of, how can we um, practice business from, or view business from a different perspective? How can it be an art again? And uh, bring in the, the human being. And I, they asked me um, about digital, um, What's my viewpoint about the perspective of the, uh, the digital economy or digital age in, in Germany? And I said, like, you know what? I think if I look at the so-called hidden champions, the medium enterprises, they have, um, they're very well prepared for the digital transformation. Um, why? I mean, there are some challenges in the technology. That's a fine thing. But they're so close to the customer. Okay? They have a very good understanding of the needs of the customers. They, they care for their employees and they, they don't just talk about corporate social responsibility, they practice it. And they know they have to continuously find ways and means to become better and better. And I think, you know, from that perspective, media enterprise is awesome because there is less bureaucracy, they're faster, they're close to the customer. I think they have a very good foundation. Uh, the other example I, I cited was like that, um, I remember when my, my kids were younger, and they, they we asked like, how was the party? And they said, well, that, that was cool because like we turned off our phones and we played and we talked. And I said like, well, not if, if, if more kids, and as, if we as adults can actually turn off our phones and go spend more time offline, um, then our kids can be role models. That's pretty cool. Um, so this basically, that was the one aspect I, I, I brought to the table. And the other aspect I mentioned, uh, I said, like, in Davos, everybody talked about you know, the wonderful opportunities that digital, digitalization brings. And I said, like, you know what? Nobody talks about the fear factor. People are actually afraid of change. They are afraid of the VUCA world, and nobody talks about it. If we want to change anything, we have to listen. We have to take the fear fears, um, you know, seriously, and we have to find new ways uh, of orientation. And actually, we have to focus more on, we should not ask the question, what will the future look like? We should ask, how do we want to live in the future? You know, that was the, the debate. And um, there was some, some, you know, it was a very interesting discussion, yes. And, and so do you think, just I'm, just, I'm just passing that through then. So, so the, the, the basis there is, um, the world is becoming more, more volatile, more uncertain, more complex, more ambiguous. And as human being, I, I fear that. And if that's true, then it's, it's useful for me to ask different questions about the future, less about how it will be and more about how I will respond to Is it something like well, that? Well, let's, 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 let's face it. Um, we have always lived in a VUCA world. It has always been this way. Maybe we haven't seen it as such. And we as human beings, we are VUCA. No, we are, I mean, we're complex. It's not, we're not machines, you know, and that's, that's life. Because that's the first, that's the first step. Then we have learned, we have lots of skills, you know, uh, you know, we know a lot. And yet we don't trust ourselves, which is kind of like weird. I mean, we trust machines more than we trust us. There is something quite wrong. I mean, do we have to be uh, a scientist to understand uh, world climate change? No, I don't. You know, um, you know, I mean, we start with us, but the question is like, do we take the time to pause and say, okay, what do I want? Who, uh, if, I, if I say, what do I want? I have to ask first, I have to answer the question, who am I? Which is tough. And then the question is like, uh, are we talking about a role or are we talking about who am I really? I mean, this people say, well, that's philosophy. Well, okay, fine. Maybe for some people it's philosophy, but it's very basic, you know? 
um, I, I recall I had this, this conversation with the, with the older couple in Davos, and I asked the question, what do you think about the digital stuff and digital age? And they say they were afraid. It just goes too fast. And I did ask the questions, like, okay, well, do you have an idea how you want to live in the future? And they said, well, of course we do. I mean, we live a wonderful life, and we, we enjoy nature, and we know, you know, and, and they just list everything. And, and said, what about technology? Oh, yeah, technology is pretty cool because it, it facilitates the process. And then I asked, uh, well, the first question was like, what will the future look like? How would you answer it now? Well, you asked a different question, they said. Okay, you asked how we want to live. And that was our answer. And I said, like, well, since you do know how you want to live, you can be a role model because help people, also younger people, ask this question because then I think we'll be better off. So by reframing the simple question, we can actually start the, the change, you know, for us. How do we want to live? As opposed to what will the, what will the future, what will the future look like? If, if we ask what will the future look like, we're passive. We become victims. We react. When we say how do we want to live, we're active. Hmm. It puts us back in the driver's seat. Right. And you, you mentioned that in one of your posts, the, the the defensive nature of, of planning, right? Yes. Planning is like whenever you plan, we use the knowledge of the past and the present. But can we plan innovation? And no. I mean, if we plan innovation, then it's not innovation anymore. I mean, we can plan an environment where new ideas can you know, be created and we develop something new, but can it be planned? Um, it, it's it's contradiction in, in, in definition. You know, you cannot really plan invention. I mean, then it's not an invention anymore if you can't plan it. Mm. You know? I mean, but you, like I said, what kind of environment do we need to um, to um, to learn best? Um, what we can learn from kids is they have a wonderful learning um, attitude. We can say, and uh, there are some statistics from uh, Pampers you know, diapers, mm. uh, 300. And 300 is not the name of the movie. It's 300 is the average time um, a kid uh, that is learning to walk, taking the first step, falls. So it falls, falls down 300 times on average before he or she takes the first step. Wow. And the cool thing, what we can learn from the kid is they don't sit there, cry, and point the finger at us and say, it's your fault. I mean, for, uh, they cannot speak anyway they just try it again, again and again until they succeed. So it's like, you learn from it, you try something new again, and we'll see. Nobody, everybody talks about the wonderful innovations. What about the failures? Nobody sees. Take the iPhone, for example. Take um, uh, uh, Astro Teller, who works for Google X, and, and in a TED talk, he talks about it, like, where they celebrate failure. You know, you get like, you have like a get a bonus, if you ask a question which can cripple a project. So they find ways, you know, find questions that can stop a project. Not the but like it's restrictive, looking back, but forward, what could happen? And okay, then let's do something different. And they're very innovative. So it has to do a lot with our attitude. And I think when we change this attitude, our perspective, um, we will get lots of new ideas, lots of answers to our questions and lots of solutions to our problems we just have to start this process but okay so in that world then where's the space for wisdom so where's the space for well i have had lots of experience oh that's good and that does give me some predictive power yeah absolutely and on on the i mean first of all when we have to understand where we're coming from we have to understand when we want to understand life we look backwards you know and maybe the present but if we want to shape the future we have to live now Okay, we use, can use the wisdom, it's a tool, okay? But wisdom is not, I mean, if we want to create and want to shape the future, we have to do so by doing. It's not a thing. It's not like a book, okay? It can help us, but it's, wisdom is something we take with us, but it should not hold us back. Right, right. And, and, and you're suggesting a, a, a reorientation. It's a reorientation. It's a different... Yeah. What, it's what do reframing. I want? What yes. could happen? Different per- perception, different... Um, a strategy we can say and it's 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 very it has to do with something going back i think it's, it's not new it's not new i think when we were little we had this attitude 
we had this mentality when we were, when we were little kids, when we had not entered school yet. Because once we enter school, we're being structured. You know, it's the mind. And we use the one brain rather than the other two brains. You know, we are learning to use the other two brains. We know, um, you know, but, you know, we have the, the intuition, the butt and, and the heart, and the heart being the, the bigger organ. We, we unlearn this. Why? Because there, it has always worked this way. And there's, it's not, not everything is bad, but we have to uh, understand that it's not the whole, the whole thing. I know that in the UK, in elementary schools, um, they have new classes in uh, mindfulness, meditation. Mm. Uh, with wonderful results, you know, with more, better social interactions, you know, uh, they learn better uh, and they're more open. I mean, I mean, if you look at the, this, you know, it's actually scientific proof, it can tell, you know, a story. And, is, and you, do, do you see the link there that the, the mindfulness has people more in, in the present, um, it, better able to process the fields? What, what do you, where, where do you see the link there? Um, yes, I think that mindfulness can help us be more present. Um, and, and, and the one thing I have to say, I'm not, even though I'm saying this, I'm, I'm saying this, and that does not mean I'm a master of mindfulness. I'm not, I'm struggling with this, you know, I mean, there are quite a few, you know, where I have worries, I have concerns, you know, I, I have fears and stuff, you know, um, and I love planning, um, and all those things rather than just like say, stop, just be in the moment. Okay. Uh, because um, if I have so many thoughts going on in my mind, uh, I miss life. Yeah, but you know, anybody, and, mm. and the things like uh, um, when we are in the present, and we can we can we be in the present and at work the whole time? I'm, I'm not. I don't think so. But when we create the time to be present, let's say at work or in, you know at home, uh, we actually create even more time. We we have something like more space for creativity. Okay. And so this one minute feels like 10 minutes and it can be worth 10 minutes. Um, and we, again, we start one minute at a time and see what happens. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of the, the, the guy uh, who's written um, Homo sapiens. Yeah. yeah Harari. Harari. Yeah. What if, that guy uh, meditates two hours a day. Seems pretty productive pretty productive dude um well sometimes you wouldn't have to meditate for two hours um each day um and meditation some people are afraid of it meditation can take many forms that's my experience if you're outside and you just uh for a few seconds okay you say you listen to the birds or you feel the wind or you listen to your heartbeat for a few seconds you can consider this you know a meditation you don't have to sit on a cushion and you know in a in a lotus position and uh, you know chant arms, you don't have to do this. You know, meditation can take many forms. When I ski, it's a form of meditation for me because why? I'm in the present. If you look at um, spiritual teachers like Eckhart Tolle, uh, he, he'd say, well, sometimes he meditates, but it's more of being in the present moment. Okay. Yeah, and the other thing I think the skiing me metaphor works is I remember when I learned, well, first started getting skiing listen lessons and. The instruction, our natural instinct when we go down the hill, when we're skiing, is to, is to rock back in our boot. Yes. And, and his instruction was, no, 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 Rich, you need to lean forward and you need to fall forward down the hill and that will give you more control. And it seems like that's an apt metaphor because what you're saying is, no, no, fall forward into the answer. Yes. Be aggressive. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, absolutely. And the thing actually, for those who don't, don't ski, but if you have ever been on a roller coaster, and they are human. It's scary when like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. But in the opposite, if you say, yeah, go for it, go for it, I want to go for it, oh, it's less scarier. You know, it's, it's like, it's not so, it's not, it's not so, it's like, oh, okay, that's cool. You know, it's like, it's less scary. You just like go for it and you enjoy it much more. Um, so, yeah, we can maybe we can trick our brain a little bit this way. Um, but it's a normal thing, uh, an instinct to, to move back, but actually, um, being at the present, moving forward, being aware of what's happening all around us, you know, to, you know, it's, it's a, it's a wider, it's more open space for, yeah. for learning. That's right. And I think as you say this, and, I, and then I'm, I'm, I'm questioning, so why this shift now? Why, why are these, these themes becoming so important now? And perhaps it's because in the past, um, in terms of the, the business environment, actually taking a more defensive stance may have been a more successful strategy for businesses, right? 
to to to, to capture some ground to to jet, to create some assets and then to defend them may have been a more successful strategy. That, that's a good point um, because see people say well we're talking about agile. I mean, does a business have to be agile to be successful? I'd say well it's it's there is no real alternative. I mean, if you want to delight the customer, but I think that. Um, you don't have to be an agile organization through and through. You can still be a human organization uh, because there are some elements in these 10 principles. You can apply day one. You can apply them right away. I mean, you start somewhere. I mean, do you have to do everything top down? Mm, it's helpful that if, you know, if, if the, the top leaders, top, uh, top managers, they believe in it and they also practice it. But rather than doing something top down because there is some resistance to change, Start with a project, with a small project, you know, where, you know, and, and where they're not, there's not so much at stake and see how it, how it uh, works out. You know, that's why I'm a fan of, of projects. You do it bottom up and see how it works, like a microcosm of a business. Right. And in your experience, do you have some, some, some shares of where you've started somewhere small and it's, it's taken off with, with a client or within a business you've worked on? Well, uh, quite a few times it happened, and, and uh, I was in a, with a client in the automobile industry uh, where we had something like we call it a swarm, a cross-functional um, team, self-organizing team. And we started with a question, um, and uh, they had some, some ideas mechanically and processes, and um, I provoked them a little bit and asked them different questions. And um, it used various methods, methodologies, frameworks, and, you know, um, Blue Ocean, Scrum, um, a lot, you know, business model generation. I mean, it was like a mixture, you know. And by the end, a couple of weeks later, um, we realized the initial solution, not, the initial, not just the initial solution, the initial, the trigger question was false. And that's kind of, that's tricky. Uh, when you realize the initial question that, um, Trigger the project is totally misleading. Luckily, the, the ideas for the solution we had could, could still not only you know, solve the initial problem, but could do much more. It was like a systemic approach. And um, that, was, that was pretty cool. That was wonderful. And, and in another in an environment, another project where um, we had uh, people from, from production, uh, product development, um, they happened to be on the same floor with uh, strategy and sales. So we just did a, a joint workshop and the sales guy said like, why are you asking these questions? They're asking the, the strategy guys and, and the, the production and product development guys and vice versa. And they realized um, they have lived on different planets. And they said, why don't we just like do something together? So rather than building a new powertrain, they developed a new mobility strategy where the powertrain was only one element in it. Mm. You know, just reframe the question, looking, open the space and see what happened. Um, the other thing is uh, what I asked earlier when we had this, this added this fourth question, you know, what makes you happy? Yeah, you let me think of that story from earlier, yeah. Um, and one, in one team, I introduced this question. It's like, well, you can do whatever you like, okay? Two weeks later, I came and um, actually the fourth question, what makes you happy? They started it with that question. And um, not only did, I mean, the, the morning meeting, um, every morning one person had to bring a cake or something from the bakery. That was the first thing they had to do. Uh, that was the first work package. Um, did it change the atmosphere? Yes, I was done. It was, that was awesome. And um, it, it's just like, it made it more human. Or especially women, in, in, when you have women in teams, um, one, one team member said like, this has been the first time in a project that she felt being accepted as a human being because she could talk about things that worried her, things that you know, was going on through her mind and sometimes and completely unrelated to work. But people could see her, uh, had a more complete picture of her. And, and that was in response to the happy question because she happy question, about Happy question or grateful question, uh, you know, and just yeah. like uh, they felt uh, being seen, being listened to. Um, and this is like, um, it's like, like I said, it can be little things. It can make a huge difference. And we just have to, it doesn't cost anything. It can make a big difference. And it can be fun. Yeah, and I just had a big insight there is that sometimes 
when I hear this, you know, okay, well, let's ask ourselves how we can be, be happy. It, it can sound very fluffy and kind of like, yeah, oh, really? But what you're talking to about that, it can get pretty real with people, right? Because in order to sometimes to answer the question, what, what would make me happy? I first need to answer the question, well, what is not making me happy right now? Could be. Right, yes. exactly. But as a, a, and, and, a le- and let's alleviate that. So I can, I can really see that as being a source for getting into issues with the team. Um, the, the, the may as as well as the the, the sort of the, the the promoting joy at some level it's also removing whatever's causing stresses within the team absolutely um, yeah no I, I can see that that's a, that's a good insight okay i know we're nearly out of time with you and i also know that you've got a book coming up right well, I'm, I'm writing a book. So we should uh, take in, in this German. time to yeah, share yes. a little bit about what's it's, happening. It's, uh, it's called Being Human in a, Digi- in a Digital Age. Oh, great title, got to say. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, it has been a therapy for me because I started working on the, on the, on the book. I had some ideas. And, and as I was writing, I had some new insights. And they're basically, uh, the, the main theme of the book is like, okay, we have, if we're looking for a new orientation in the, in the digital world, we have to find us. We have to be, become more human. So the first part of the book is about on the individual level, uh, what can we do to open the human space for us? How can we find us again? And the second question, the second part of the book is about, well, how can you, how can we apply it in work, in business? So it talks about, you know, a project work, it talks about human business, talks about agile uh, as a, as a door opener to, to human business. And uh, so this is the second part and the, the, the conclusion, the third part is about um, how everything fits together and how the golden rule, you know, treat others as you want to be treated, can be kind of like help the transition from a traditional company or traditional business to a human business. Mm-hmm. And, the golden know, rule, just expand on that. What do you mean by that? Well, the golden rule is more like more than thousands and thousands of years old. You know, like I said, and, and, and the Bible says, treat others as you want to be treated. You go back, I think, 5,000 uh, BC, uh, where the Egyptians they had something similar, and Buddhism, there's something similar. So it's not like it's a Christian um, you know, principle of human interaction. It has been a global phenomenon. Um, and the thing is, like, um, if you want to, what we people say, if you want to love thy neighbor, um, like yourself or ask yourself, okay, fine. That means you first have to love yourself. Well, that is tough because um, do I always love myself? I mean, not talking about egoism or anything. That's something different, okay? That's, uh, that's the ego. I'm not talking about, you know, egotism. It's I'm talking about self-love or self-compassion. If I want to practice compassion, I have first have to be able to practice self-compassion. And that is tough you know and i'm working on it and i'm 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 actually also sharing my my uh, you know hardship you know my my experiences i'm saying you know i'm i'm not the expert far from it but this is like what helped me maybe it can help you as well mm. awesome well i'm gonna really look forward to uh to that when it comes up and we'll definitely share it with the the, the listeners um, and, and for those who are listening, sometimes you, you might interview one well, might interview an expert and there's always this question, you know, are they really, are they the real deal, right? Do they, do they, uh, do they walk their talk? But I yes. can absolutely say that, uh, you, you certainly do in the lead up to this interview, you've been doing a tango marathon, you're going free climbing, uh, tomorrow, I think it seems to me that you, you have a very rich life full of happiness. You're making space for your own human needs and wants, uh, with, within business. So. Uh, it, it seems to me that you're you're implementing this in your in your life. Well, I'm working on it, and there are always setbacks, and uh, I have to remind myself to stay on course. Yeah, no, it's a, it was a bit it's worth it. <laughs> yeah, inspiring to, to to just hear these vignettes of your life. So, yeah, excellent. Okay, um, I know you 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 need to leave, so um, I want to thank you once again for your time. It's been thank you. very stimulating for me. Um, yeah, I look forward to the book. I hope, uh, well, and, and people, for those of you before the book, you know, check Tom, Dr. Thomas out on, the, on LinkedIn, read your post. There's a lot there. They're very easy to read, very clear. Um, yes, there's some great stuff out there. Um, and is that, is that the best place for people to point you? Is it social media? Is there anywhere else you'd like to? Well, yes, in terms the, of places link, to LinkedIn is, is a, good, a good, good way. Uh, you can also go to motivatedtobe.com, uh, which hasn't been updated. That, that frequently will change in the near future. 
you can find me on uh, Instagram, you know, motivate to be, and, uh, as well as on, on, on Facebook. There is a, a actually a Facebook group called Being Human, ah. and uh, that's one of my my small groups where I try to, I should say, I prototype some of the insights I am also sharing in my book. And uh, there are not many members, but if you, uh, you know, uh, this, is, this is also where I plan to share some of my um, uh, book chapters before it will be published next year. Excellent. Okay. Well, thanks very much. We'll put the links to those in the, in the description for the show. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I, th I think you're off to a tango. Is that right? Uh, tonight, yeah, I'm, tonight, I'm just, it's a regular uh, uh, tango milonga tonight, and tomorrow I'm doing some free climbing. Excellent. All right. Well, well, good luck with that. Thank you. Uh, and thank you so much.